Now to introduce our presenter for tonight's lecture. John Muir Laws, who goes by Jack, is a principal leader and innovator of the worldwide nature journaling movement. Jack is a scientist, educator, and author who helps people forge a deeper and more personal connection with nature through keeping illustrated nature journals and understanding science. He is trained as a wildlife biologist and is an associate of the California Academy of Sciences. Jack is the founder and president of the Wild Wonder Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to encouraging nature connection and conservation through attention, curiosity, art, science, and community. He is also the founder and host of the Nature Journal Club, a family-friendly intergenerational community that connects with nature through art and field journaling. So we can't wait to hear from you tonight. Uh, so at this point, I will turn things over to Jack to get us started. Thank you so much, Amy. It's a delight to be here with all of you. Um, let's see, Amy, am I spotlighted? Not yet. I'm going to do that right now. Okay, do that. And there we go. How about that? Hi there, everybody. I'm Jack. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. What I want to do tonight is to talk to you a little bit about the way that our brain works on nature and some strategies that I think are really, really high percentage strategies to get more out of when we go for a ramble in the forest and um, or, or a walk through the garden, how to, without having to memorize a bunch of facts about nature, how to, from your own observations, make more out of each encounter we have with the natural world. And for me, I find that when I do this, um, there is, there's a real joy that comes from paying attention to the natural world around me. The more that I can get myself to, to, to notice nature's details, the more the world around me is just this, this forever revealing, wonderful experience. And that can be um, available to all of us um, without knowing, having to know all the Latin names of everything that's out there. Um, and it's also something that we can teach our children, um, a way of understanding and appreciating and interacting with the natural world that I think you will find makes them better observers, improves memory, um, makes for much more interesting and nuanced questions, and helps us be more curious about the world around us. So that's a tall order, but I think that we can fill it. And I want to show you my fundamental strategy as a naturalist. I've been a naturalist all my life. I mean, my parents named me John Muir Laws. So if your parents name you that, you have to kind of get your naturalist chops on. So from an early age, I've been turning over rocks and, and, and uh, climbing up trees and all of that business. Still do. And, but the more that I've been able to kind of refine these ideas, it just makes every experience of being out in nature just that much more fun. So we're going to start by opening up our, our, our minds here. And I'm gonna get out my brain. There we go. So this is, our critical tool as, as a naturalist. We have, actually your eyes are technically an extension of your brain. And the, uh, that our, our, our whole experience of being out there is processed through this little wad of electric meat that sits between your ears. And this is, it's a very, very interesting thing. Um, our brains, it turns out, are not a, an infinite capacity vessel for kind of wrestling with things. There are real limits to how much your brain can take in at one moment and to be able to process. And this actually has real implications for how we interact with the natural world. Um, the uh, there's, there's, there's a phenomenon called our cognitive load, and that's like how much stuff you can entertain in your working memory at one point. And it is surprisingly low. 
right? You can handle about seven things at once. A little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the moment, um, and depending on your brain. But that's not a lot of stuff. You try to pack in more than that, what your brain starts doing is kind of forgetting this so it can pay attention to this. So there's all sorts of crazy studies on cognitive load, and it keeps kind of coming up with something around this number, and um, which really reveals that we cannot handle much of complexity. And if, if you just, if you look out the window right now, there is, there's an infinite amount of complexity and, and subtlety and, and, and nuance going on every second with everything that you see around you. But our brains aren't able to handle that. Like, like you want all of nature? <laughs> you can't handle all of nature, right? You get your seven plus or minus two. That's your cognitive load. And so our ability to attend to things is really limited just by the capacity of our electric meat. And it gets more interesting than that um, because we're also, we're using this, this brain to attend to things. We're also using it to store information. So when I go out and I, I make an observation about a bird, um, I'm going to remember that. And the next time I'm out there and I'm seeing this sort of set of features, I go like, oh, female northern cardinal, right? And I, I know a few things about you, perhaps from stuff that I've read or perhaps from, from, from experiences that I've had. But um, the problem with storing stuff kind of and, and retrieving stuff from here is this is an incredible incredibly leaky tool for holding information. It's not, our brains are not good at remembering stuff. And um, so when we're trying to do that, when we're trying to kind of go out in nature and sort of, I'm going to pay attention with this brain and I'm going to then remember stuff, your brain's not good at either. So what happens is you'll have an experience, you'll learn some stuff, then your brain rapidly starts forgetting that. And then you try to uh, 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 try to recall it at another time. And here's what happens. Um, your brain might remember a few little details of something and it gives that back to you, but it also, there's all these other details of whatever experience you had that, um, that you've forgotten. But what your brain does without telling you is it starts filling in all the little details with stuff that it completely makes up. And it doesn't show you the difference between those. So part of the memories that you have of that, they think of like something that happened back in childhood. I remember this vividly. The vividness is not an indicator of the accuracy of our memories. It doesn't work that way. Our memories are constantly changing. And it turns out that when we recall things, like you say, like, I'm just going to like really write this thing. I'm remembering it all the time. The, the, the stories that we tell the most are the ones that are most likely to change because each time your brain is like, I'm going to sub, I, I don't know what this detail is. I'm going to substitute something else in there. And then the next time you're remembering it, your brain isn't like, like opening up a file on your computer and whoop, the whole thing comes back up. Your brain is sort of like a really, really bad photocopy machine. So you take your memory, you put it down on the on the glass, and it comes out this this sort of terrible version of it, and then you kind of go like, "Ooh, that's not right." So you get out your marker and you fix all the things on that. And the next time you're remembering that thing, you put it back on the bad photocopy machine, and now this bad copy of the revised memory pops out to you. And now you feel in all those details there. And that means every time you're remembering this, you're tweaking your memories. So a whole bunch of our memories, part of it may be things that actually related to an experience you had, although we find that false, entirely false memories are really easy to generate, but a whole bunch of it is just confabulation. And so confabulation is like the stuff that you're, your brain is making up. And we do this 
with just about everything that we encounter, we also do this when we're in nature. And like, how many times have you been out there and kind of watched, you know, been out there by the, by the, uh, by the shore? I'm on the West Coast, so maybe you're not looking at the shore where you are. You say, you say to your, your, your partner or your friend with you, like, you know, ah, this is the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. Well, guess what? It's not. It's just that you have forgotten all of the other ones. And like there's there's no way that the, 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 the sublime experiences that we have, the, the beautiful, these deep connection moments in nature. Um, you know, hold on a minute. Um, I'm in the middle of, of, of doing a, 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 a workshop here. If this is really critically important, we, we can do it fast. But otherwise, can we talk about this when I'm done? That's okay. I love you. Um, so um, where was I? Oh yeah, the sunset. I was forgetting where we were. Huh. Um, so you, you've forgotten all the other ones. So your brain doesn't have this way of remembering these, these beautiful, these sublime moments that you have. Um, Sometimes it's it's pretty good at sort of trying to register trauma that we have, but these these wonderful moments that we have, these beautiful, joyful moments of connection in the natural world, your brain doesn't have a really good storage system for those unless you do some strategies that are really intentional. And you can also use these strategies for all sorts of other things that help us be able to um, to to make the most of our observations. So I'm going to teach you a three step method for paying deeper attention to the natural world. This three-step method you can also do when you read a book or watch a movie or just about anything in your life um, that you want to pay deeper attention to. One of the ways of kind of finding deeper happiness in the life we have is to be more present and to pay attention to the moment that we're in. And this is an incredibly useful three-part system to help you do that. And so um, we're going to go through those, those steps, and then I'm going to demonstrate doing that um, right in front of you with an interesting phenomenon. So the first part is to pay attention. Now, that's kind of a cheat, right? Um, that how do you get better at paying attention paying attention like so if i say to you like right i want you to look really hard at this actually let's try this okay like look really hard at this look no no harder look look harder look really really hard look really hard um, i think that telling somebody to look hard at something is probably the most useless instruction you could probably possibly give somebody like you just like you start staring at it more and it kind of stares back like yeah yeah what, what happens really quickly when you do this is your brain kind of goes like okay it's not going to eat me i'm not going to eat it i actually don't have to look hard at this so i'm not so your brain is really really smart um your brain knows that thinking is difficult and if it doesn't have to it won't I mean, this thing is only 2% of your body weight, but it consumes 20% of all the calories you consume. I mean, that's a ton of energy. Like one out of every five burritos goes to this. So if your body can, can, can kind of downregulate that so you don't have to think really hard, it doesn't. So you say like, look really hard at this and your brain goes like, okay, it's, it's not gonna eat me. And I know I'm not gonna eat it we're cool. So how do you get yourself to, 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 to pay deeper attention to what is, is, is right in front of you? And this, this, this first strategy is really counterintuitive, um, especially if you have been raised in the traditional school system, right? Um, where we're told to sit at your desk and be quiet and kind of take notes and learn. But the idea is you activate your mouth. When 
you are making observations. If you see something, say something. So the idea is that if you want to get your brain to notice details more richly, then whatever they are, say them out loud. You want to say it out loud. And when you do that, it will change the way that your brain registers and pays attention to that information. Your brain actually can't kind of go like, do, 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 I'm checking out. If you are describing something out loud, if you're trying to describe it in your head, then it works. I mean, so, so if, if, if you're trying to describe things in your head, then your brain can absolutely check out anytime it wants. And you don't really know your mind wandering until later on. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take a little phenomenon and I'm going to put it in, in front of us. All right. This is something that my friend found. And we're going to take a look at this cone. And what I'm going to ask you to do at home is humor me on this. We're, we're going to try something that will feel weird. It will feel weird. I'm going to ask you to speak out loud and to talk to the computer screen. No one is there. Don't, you'll be really tempted just to do this in my, your head or kind of be like, I'm going to wait for the next thing. I kind of know what you're talking about. But I really want you to try it because I want you to, to notice the difference between look really hard at this and this second way of looking at something where if you see something, say something. So what you're going to do is you're just going to, whatever it is, you are going to just let, let it rip out of your mouth. So for instance, if I were trying to, um, to, to do that with this, I'd be going, oh, mostly pink, really, really lumpy. There's a major suture down the middle of it. Whoa. Oh. And uh, it comes apart. There's actually other parts that are, mm, this, this little model is kind of cut into pieces. There's this darker gray part on the bottom that is really stripy. This part here has like big lumps on it. This part here, it's like these fine little wrinkles. Then there's this second little wrinkly area down in here with this, this thing. And I think these parts have been painted yellow. And so you see what I'm doing? Basically, if I notice something, I'm just saying it out loud, right? And this is, this is a, a, a psychological trick called the production effect. And what you're doing is in order to get something from your eyes to your mouth, it has to really go through your brain and register in there. So I'm going to just ask you to do a stream of consciousness riff with this, All right? I'm gonna put this under my document camera. And um, again, at home, humor me here, try this, because you're, you're, you'll be really tempted just to kind of go like, no, but, but really see what it is like to say it out loud. This is actually taught to police officers when they're on patrol, that if they are observing something and they're going to have to report on it and they want that to be accurate, they're trained to actually start saying out loud the details of what they're noticing in this moment. And that makes their memory much, much better. Here we go. And then I'll tell you how to not lose your teeth. So I'm going to change the screen to this one. All right, there it is, there it is. All right, boom, and I'm gonna zoom down on it a little bit. And um, go. Keep going, stream of consciousness riff. If you if you stall out and just sort of the, the observations stop coming, just drop back into some little detail and just say it out loud. Fifteen more seconds, pack at least three things into that time. Hi, I'm back. All right. Now, if you actually spoke out loud, what I want you to do is at this point, notice what is in your brain. Notice, notice the stuff that is there. Notice the details, the specific details about that, right? If you just sort of stared at it, there'd be kind of a general impression. But if you were speaking things out loud, just start going through them in your head and notice how many of those things that you said out loud are still actually there at your brain's fingertips. 
Isn't that weird? It really works. And you can do this about all sorts of stuff. You can do this with a pine cone. You also, if you want to stop losing your keys and you're going to be putting your keys down in a weird place, is say out loud, I'm putting my keys in the outer pouch of the backpack and actually say it out loud. And then later on, you'll be like, oh, dude, where's my keys? You'll be like, oh, they're in the, they're, they're in the outer pouch of the backpack because you spoke it out loud. Again, that's the production effect. And it's a great way to initially get yourself to pay more attention. So this starts um, the cascade of naturalist skills. You're going to start, you're saying these things out loud, and it helps you notice things more, right? So this is the first part is what we call I notice. If you see something, say something. And now we're going to add to this a second category of things to do with whatever phenomenon catches your attention in nature. So you're going to start with noticing things. And then what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to make ourselves curious about what we see. We are going to not wait for curiosity to come to us. Sometimes curiosity comes, right? It's just like, whoa, right? But here's the problem. Very often when we realize we don't know something, if you're a part of regular Western culture, this is a weakness. It's a vulnerability and we're embarrassed by it. And so we don't tell anybody. There's not a lot of people going around like, you won't believe how much stuff I don't know, right? But every, uh, every naturalist who's really honest with you will tell you that there's that there's an infinite amount of stuff that they don't know. And um, some stuff that they kind of, uh, yeah, but the evidence isn't very good for this. And there's other stuff that we have that's kind of, that's, that's, that's more solid, but there's going to be a ton of stuff that we don't know. If we can get ourselves actually curious about some phenomenon in front of us, then what happens is our brain releases dopamine in response to being curious about something. And in the presence of this neurotransmitter, um, what happens is your brain will start to work better, right? You've got all this neurotransmitter available to it. Your, your memory for stuff, um, your ab level to ability to focus on things all happens because you got curious. So you start with making observations. And what you're waiting for is this little subtle whoop to kind of come up that kind of says like, hmm, I don't really understand that thing. Right. And it will come up subtly. Right. It's not like, like, oh, my God. Right. No, it doesn't present itself like that. So Isaac, Isaac Asimov said that sort of, you know, the great discoveries in science are not heralded with Eureka. Right. But with that's funny. So if you get one of these kind of like, huh. Right. It's, it, it will hit you subtly. Like. Right. Then this is what we 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 realize that we're on to something big. So if you get a little kind of that's funny feeling from what you're looking at, say that out loud with your other things. What you want to do is notice how much stuff you don't know about this. What you're trying to do is make curiosity happen to you. And one way of doing this is you can just look at some phenomenon and just start asking questions. And some of the first questions that you ask are not going to be really rich, deep, interesting questions, but they pave the way for the more interesting nuanced questions that are a little bit behind them. And so what you do is you start with, I notice, and then the I wonders will start to pop up and play with you. And when that happens, um, your brain starts working differently. And this will help you stick with a phenomenon longer. And um, it also is fun, right? That, that kind of like lean in feeling you get when you're really curious about something. Um, it's, it's a fun feeling. And so you get positive reinforcement from doing this. Your brain then wants to do it again and again, like, let's do some curiosity. Um, you can get to the point that the, the kind of the joy of kind of going spelunking down rabbit holes is something that you will eagerly seek out. And, um, a great way of doing this is, you know, you're, you're looking at, you're, 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 you're looking at, at some phenomenon 
And you can think of the, you know, the who, what, where, when, how, why, um, those old questions, and just sort of prompt yourself with, with one of them. Um, like, let's say you're doing, um, you, know, uh, you know, who, right? Um, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. Um, so, like, I'm, I might say, like, you know, who, like, is this cast a cast from a real skull? Um, who was that person? Right. What was their life like? Were they male? Were they female? What, what what were their sort of joys and those sorts of things? So here I'm just sort of thinking about who, and it's taken me in this direction, right? Um, like who is the team of um, kind of biologist nerds who kind of figured out that we should use magnets to kind of hold this one? Just like, ah, right? Um, you know, like how is like I want to like who is questions are going to be very different than if I hold on a second, quick lid back on there we go um who questions would be very um different than let's say if i asked so let's say uh um a, a a how question right um how was this cast here i'm thinking about the physical model if i think about a real skull um you know um how um um how do broken bones kind of heal themselves um how do, and I'm just looking at this, this isn't like a, some, something that I've kind of scripted in my head, but I might think like, like how do muscles attach onto here, right? Like the, it's, it, there's, I, I know it's like, what are like muscle to bone, uh, it's a tendon ligament. That's a tendon, right? Um, so like how do, how do, how do tendons um, sort of stick on to, to, to these, to, to, to the bone here? Um, what, what makes, what makes that work? So you want to just sort of like, there you're thinking about function. When you're thinking about a when question, you're thinking about timing. Um, you're thinking about, I'm just saw a little hummingbird outside my window. You're like, when do you migrate? Like, when do you go to sleep at night? Like when is going to get me different sorts of questions with that hummingbird than a where question? Where do you sleep at night? Right. You know, how big is your little territory? I'm thinking about space. So if I can get myself to be curious about whatever plant or, or animal, any, anything that I find out there, the world really starts to open up and it's really fun. But something that we have to embrace is the, and, and, and be totally comfortable with is the idea that there's a ton of stuff that I don't know and that's okay. And, and it's not something to be ashamed of. It is the beginning of an adventure. Um, some people who take, say, classes in botany, you walk out with them in the field and it will seem like they know everything. Um, but you start asking a few questions and very quickly, you kind of get to the point where, honestly, everybody will say like, oh, gosh, I don't know. Be really comfortable with that point where you don't know the answer. And look for those because that is the point where we can start to really expand beyond that. So these two starting points are making observations and asking questions. You get these two things going, and then there's a third piece. Let me share with you the third piece, and then we'll do a little demonstration that I think you th might think is interesting. What I'm going to do is the first one is for attention. The second one is for curiosity. This third one is to intentionally train your brain to be more creative. Train yourself to be a creative thinker. And I know that creativity has become a kind of almost like a, a buzzword. Anybody's playing like an online game, right? They're going to advertise like this enhances creativity, right? Um, uh, there's, there's some after school program for kids. They're going to say this enhances creativity, but like, what are they talking about? How do you, how are you going to measure that? Um, it basically is sort of turned into a meaningless word of something that means good about the way you think. Oh, that's really creative. All right. So being a little bit of a scientist myself, I have a, I've come up with a working definition that I think is useful. And here is my definition of creativity. So creativity is your brain's ability to make useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. 
So if I can take this and this like this is kind of like this and it's sort of fitting together in this way, but it's different in these ways. But these things are really kind of similar to each other, right? So you are, you are training your brain to be a connector. You're training your brain to connect ideas. This is huge, right? So um, the way I remember these three things is I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. It reminds me of is for getting our brains to say like, what is this like? Why well, is it similar to that? I want to try to make those connections. If I am doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of with any phenomenon out there, um, I'm going to discover things about it that I never knew. I'm going to wonder things about it. And I want to intentionally go out and sort of see like, how is this how does this relate to stuff that is already kind of hooked into my gray matter from perhaps experiences that I've had or things that I've read um, or something somebody told me? You know, these can be as scientific or as metaphoric or poetic as you're feeling at the moment. But intentionally kind of goes like for, uh, assess, you know, what is my prior knowledge of this? How does this how does this relate to me? And then it makes any experience that you're looking at more personal, you connect with it more, and um, you'll be surprised at the sort of things that come up. Very often, you, you, as you do this more, you're going to find you just can start to make more and more connections between things. And sometimes this just makes the object more interesting, and sometimes there can be really, you know, useful results of that. Like a lot of the the inventions that have come from the field of biomimicry, where people kind of look at something in nature and kind of like, hmm. That solves a problem. We could use that to solve other problems. You know, it comes from this kind of thinking as well. That's not the only tool for it. So I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, that's my naturalist mantra. And what I do when I go outside, I'm walking around and I'm doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, I walk up to a tree. I can do it with a tree. I walk up to a bird. I can do it with a bird. You don't really scare the birds by doing this. The birds are kind of looking at you kind of like, eh, yeah, you're not really behaving like a predator. We're cool. And, um, and you definitely don't scare away the flowers. But you start doing this, and you can do this socially. You can do this with other people. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And see where it takes your brain. So just as an example of this, I'm going to now do this with my little friend, the cone. And I'm going to do it in a specific way. Um, I remember I mentioned that kind of getting things, that, that this electric meat is limited in its capacity to hold information. I have my um, my seven plus or minus two. And if I'm trying to do this, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of just in my head. It's much richer than just staring at something. But there's something that I can do um, that um, is even more effective than that. And what it is, is I want to get these ideas out of here and to put them into something that will allow me to hold and kind of collect a bunch of these observations and these questions and these connections so that I can do something even more with them. And this is what we, we, we call in cognitive science is externalizing your thinking. So you're going to get it out of here and into some other form. You can, for instance, do this by having a conversation with your friend. You're getting it from out of here and you're externalizing it. It's now into this conversation space. Just saying things out loud does a little bit of this. But there's a tool that um, there is actually a whole suite of tools that almost all of us are already using. And if you apply those tools to, um, you apply those tools to playing in nature you're going to find there's a, just a wonderful richness that happens. And what I'm talking about is to get things um, out of your head and into a little notebook. Carry a little notebook with you of some form. And get those ideas out of there. These can be, um, you know, some people like to have, you know, I've got a whole bunch of small little notebooks. I've got larger notebooks. I've got even larger notebooks. You want to have a notebook with you that you're realistically going to be willing to bring with you. 
the larger you can go and still realistically bring this with you, the better off you are. Um, if the only thing you'll bring is a tiny little one, okay, bring a tiny little one. But if you can get yourself up a little bit larger, that's good. Um, or even larger is better. But if it gets to the point where you're going to leave that at home, no, um, go back to a smaller size. So you've got a notebook, and what you're going to try to do is get the stuff out of your head and onto paper. They were already really doing this in all sorts of ways. How many people have a list like this in your kitchen? Okay, everybody. And the reason that we do that is because it works. Like, if you're thinking, like, oh, eggs. Got to remember the eggs, 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 eggs. Got to remember the eggs. Got to remember the eggs. Remember the eggs. Remember the eggs. Right? You can't functionally do anything else while you're going eggs, 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 eggs. And the minute you start doing something else, you forget about the eggs. You get to the grocery store and you're like, I know there is something that we needed. But you put it on your list, then you can. This works as an extension of your brain. Calendars work in the same way too. These are our are, are paper extensions of our brain. You then don't have to hold that there and it works, right? Our brain kind of knows when to look out to that or when to look out to that. And then we can, we, we can, uh, we can be more functional in the world. Um, so this is uh, what the cognitive psychologists call your distributed cognition. Right, so you're taking the job of thinking and you're spreading it out among these different tools so that you, what you can, you're going to do with your precious seven plus or minus two, it's, you don't have to remember the eggs. Now let's apply this to taking a look at the pine cone. I'm going to go, jump back to the... Let's see where we want to go. We want to go right there. Um, this this is a journal, right? And um, what what I've got here, and sort of open it up to some random pages here. This is <clears throat> this is is this st studies of a dandelion. This is finding a mutant poppy. They're supposed to have four, all the ones in the book say they've got, they've got um, four petals in them. And let's see, this one had one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And that's, uh, that's, that's crazy. So we found this, this mutant poppy and kind of making some studies of it. Um, then got really into other poppies and um, the, uh, the, so we found some with eight, some with seven, some with six petals, um, you know, this is, this is crazy. So here are like these, these mutant, these, uh, mutant poppies. Like this one had this, this is a drawing of one that had eight petals. That's really weird. It's not supposed to be like that, but what I'm doing is I am making observations and I am putting those down on paper. So what is going on this page, right? If you look at it, you're going to see observations you're going to see questions and you're going to see it reminds me of. So I'm just doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, but I'm putting it, getting it out of my head and onto paper, right? Uh, going up to Alaska and taking a little jet boat out across uh, the, uh, the, 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 the delta there of the Copper River. Um, these are all sorts of observations that I'm making. Um, and, uh, you know, so this, um, or, or here's taking a look at a little, here's a little flower and what do I have here? Um, so observations and these can be, you can put those observations down in, in many ways, right? Um, so you'll see that I am using drawings. I, I, I draw a lot of pictures. So you'll see. You know, here's a little picture of a goose. Here's a little picture of somebody being a moose. You know, here's a map of where I am. Um, all of those are pictures. Um, but I'm also using a lot of words. 
sometimes it's hard to write a question or an Eric reminds me of with a picture. These um, are really functionally different on the page. If I'm just drawing pictures, I can't make as rich observations as I'm using if, as if I'm using both of these together. Um, similarly, um, if I also bring in numbers, then I have a much larger vocabulary of how I can get stuff down on paper. And so what I do is I use these words, pictures, and numbers together to record my observations, questions, and connections. That's what this journaling process is. And don't worry, you don't have to be an artist. Um, you don't have to spell things correctly. It's just any way of kind of getting stuff out of your head and onto paper is really, really valuable. So look at this, like, here's a question, like who is the pollinator of this plant? Um, there's glistening material all over here, right? And um, is that glistening material nectar, right? I'm asking questions. I'm excited that I don't know. There's notches in the tips. Why are those notches up there? Um, which ones are petals? Which ones are sepals? What are what are the you know official parts in this little thing? Um, and then what else is going on here? I R M O. What is that? Uh, I R M O. Oh, it reminds me of. Look, here's a whole list of it reminds me of. So this reminds me of tinsel. It reminds me of water. These little. Um, uh, the, it reminds me of the glistening stuff on a sundew. Um, the, uh, you know, so it, uh, you know, all of, all of these things, right, are little things that this reminds me of. Um, I was with some, some children who said, like, it reminded them of the tinsel that you put on things to scare birds away. And so they're saying, like, could this glistening stuff be, you know, is this a something to scare some things away from the flower? Is it a sticky trap in the flower? So you see how kind of getting these ideas, we're kind of wondering about, like, what's up with this glisten stuff? And here's the glisten it reminds me of. This just takes this one little part of, you could just sort of stop at, like, look, there's some glistening material in here. I've made my observation. And then go on to forget that. But here, actively asking questions, actively putting in it reminds me of, right? And what I'm able to do with these really blossoms. Words, pictures, and numbers. Oh, look, this thing's magnified three times. There's a number. There's a number, right? Um, back here, when we're looking at numbers of, of, of petals, those are numbers, right? Um, and so you see words, pictures, numbers, I notice I wonder what it reminds me of. What I'm doing is I'm taking these two systems. I notice I wonder what it reminds me of, words, pictures, numbers. I'm syncing those together and putting it down onto the page. You don't have to worry about having to make pretty pictures. You don't have to worry about your spelling. You don't have to worry about being right about anything, but what I find when I take any phenomenon and start applying this approach to it, all sorts of interesting things happen, right? So um, let's take a look at, um, I'm gonna go get a little journal here and we're going to see, um, what happens when we try this? And where is my piece of paper? Ah, my piece of paper is all the way over here. One moment. And I think I'll use this journal. Nope, not that journal. Too many journals about the house here. Ah, this is the one. All right. So I've got another journal here. And let's let's see what we can do. All right. I'm going to we're going to take a look at what this 
I notice, I wonder it reminds me of is like, now I, um, I can see the things that you um, put into the chat, right? Um, and so I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna ask everybody just start with observations. When you look at this, what do you notice? What do you notice? Just take a bunch of your observations and drop them into the chat and uh, and hit send. So let's make a whole bunch of observations. Um, while you're starting to kind of load those in, I'm gonna just sort of start on a little drawing here. I'm gonna show you that this doesn't have to be a pretty picture. Small scales at the top and they get larger and wider apart as they go down. All right, so we've got this part up here, small, boom. Then we've got this zone down here with big. So these are gonna be the big, these are gonna be the small, right? Yep, oh, very thick stem. Leg is spiraling, it's asymmetrical. That's right, there's sort of this big part up here and small over here. Oh, these are great, these are great, these are great. Um, 12 layers of scales, you're counting. Check you out, Ronald, I see you there, All right? Um, Susan, hi. Um, observation, the scales on the upper left are uh, big flat tips. The scales on the right are little and flat. So big bulby ones up here, small ones out here. Okay, okay, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I've just sort of blocked this in loosely here and um, I'm gonna grab a pen. What pen? This pen, this pen, why not this pen? And so it doesn't have to be, um, you'll, you're gonna see that this doesn't have to be like a big uh, pretty picture. Somebody mentioned these things are kind of in spiral rows. I can put in some of those spiral rows and there's some layers in here. I'm gonna write that somebody counted for me. There are 12 rows. Okay, thank you for counting that for me. And they're, they're, they're big um, and bulby down here. Right, and then they're smaller, and then they're then they're kind of coming across here, and then as they kind of are coming across here, they are getting flatter. Uh, and so uh, big, um, big bulbs, big 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 scale, and flat scale. Right? And you think like, oh no, how do you do this whole thing? Uh, I'm not going to, right? Um, I'm going to, uh, maybe I could just put in some, I'm gonna put in some little lines like this. I'm gonna say small scales, right? And then I'm gonna put in, so that there's a few kind of other big ones at the edge here and and so these, um, then there are these horizontal rows. Um, I'll just put in one of these rows here. This one is flat. And so you've got little kind of row flat ones kind of coming along here. And so these ones down here are open and they're flat and they're small and small scales like this part here, this is all, this part here is closed, um, more tightly closed, more tightly. And then there's a little, whoop, a little stem kind of sticking off here. And Right, like not a pretty picture, but notice how I'm able to record a ton of information about this with this not a pretty picture, right? So uh, these ones are shredded. And these ones here are not shredded. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to, from this, we're going to kind of move into 
All right, what does this make you wonder? So can we turn some of these observations into questions, right? Um, so um, Lori's wondering, like, are there some scales missing on the bottom right third? If yes, I wonder what happened. If no, why am I am unable to see them clearly? Like, so are down in here, right? Are, is this, are, are like there's the very few scales here. Are we missing some or is, um, and, um, or, or if they, I'm not missing some, so why, why can't I see them? I also, I just love that kind of scientific thinking. Like you're not just assuming that I don't see them there, therefore they're not there. You're wondering, is that what I'm seeing? So being kind of sensitive to the possibility that perhaps my observations may not be accurate. Boom, that's great. I wonder why the lower scales are open. So like, why, why are these open? All right, um, are there more? Are there some that fell off? Um, the, let's see, scales in the bottom is trying to admit, are there some scales missing in the bottom right? Um, I wonder if all the seeds are gone. Um, any seeds in here still? Right. Um, do all scales have a corresponding seed? What is the ratio of of of, of scales to 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 seeds? Ooh. Um, scales to seeds. So, what is the ratio of scales to seeds? And do do all scales have have the 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 same number of seeds? All scales have same number of seeds. Huh. Interesting. Um. How how big did this tree? What kind of tree did it come from? How big was that tree? Um. Will these small scales get bigger? Um, so, you know, why big? Um, will you grow? Right, so you see how when I am, um, you know, putting in these, uh, putting kind of getting this down on on the paper here this is much more much much more um than we get with our seven plus or minus two once i'm kind of getting things out of my head and onto the paper here i can blow past this limit i can tear past this limit with with all the things that i can do and, and then um, there's still, it reminds me of. So let's just try that with this. Let's take a look. Remember, you can be as playful as you want. You can be as scientific as you want. Anything in your head that kind of connects to, um, to, to, to a neuron. You know, for me, these are shingles. You know, um, what else do we have? Reminds me of an anatomical heart. Right? Um, reminds me of a Christmas tree shape. Especially when I hold it like that, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Uh, rise and fall reminds me of an ornament. A pear, a fruit. Um, similar to porcupine needles. Oh, interesting. Um, 
I'd love to hear more about that. Like, what do you see that reminds you of the porcupine? See, somebody's got more porcupine um, it, it, it experience than I do. Oh, it looks like a ballerina on point. Oh, can you not unsee that now? Like, look at that. It's a little ballerina. So I am um, going to give this little ballerina a little dress. You could write ballerina, but when you have a chance to um, to draw one, why not? All right? doesn't have to be a pretty picture, right? Fish scales, uh, when mature fish bend as they swim. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, um, I'm going to give myself, I call this a to-do box, where I kind of give myself a little check-off box like this. Um, I'm going to say, check out how scales on fish move with bending, right? And so I'm going to see this, and that, you know, when I put it in a little box like this, it makes me want to kind of follow up on this. There's something that I now want to kind of geek up, right, um, and, 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 and learn. Right? Isn't that interesting? Um, the uh, it reminds me of gaps crack between wool locks on sheep. Like I wonder if you know are there functional? Sometimes it's just you know happenstance that something kind of looks similar. Sometimes there are functional things that are going on in a phenomenon that tie into um, to uh, to 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 another phenomenon. That's why this this intentionally kind of going there. This they also these these kind of it reminds me of things. You know, it, it's it's fun. It's fun to 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 do this. Right? And now. Um, Susan Beckhart wrote in one of the previous chests, reminds me of cobblestones. Look at this part right up here. Look at this. Can you see the cobblestone street? Ah! ah. Corn on the cob. Corn. Now, why is it that these have patterns that are similar to cobblestones. Um, is it that people who are doing cobblestone stuff are taking inspiration from nature? Is there a functional thing about the way you lay down cobblestones that also kind of ties into here? See this, it reminds me of really, really interesting. Now, Susan mentioned, like, what would happen if we turned this over? Are you ready to have your mind blown? Because that's the reason that um, I picked this up. Actually, my friend Mark Simmons found this in a parking lot and, um, and turned it over and found something that was really interesting. And what I'm going to ask you to do is when we turn this over is we're going to, I'm going to ask you at home to do your, I notice, I wonder it reminds me of with this phenomenon out loud saying your, I notice, I wonder it reminds me of, and then drop, um, drop any of those that are really interesting into the chat, ones that kind of float to the surface, like, oh, I got to share this one. So, you know, give us some really juicy, I notices, I wonders, it reminds me of, and we're going to drop those into this chat. Are you ready? This is really really weird. And I want you to envision what it looks like on the other side. And by the way, hint, it's a cross section. Are you ready? Ready? This is so weird. Look at that. Wah, wah, wah. So first notice that there's any micro surprise here. Oh, I didn't expect that, right? What didn't you expect? What is different that you're seeing than the way you expected this to be? What is different here? And notice that when we discover something that is different than we expect, this is an opportunity for us to learn 
from nature. Nature is doing something that is like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. And so give me some, I notice this, I wonder, it reminds me of. It's organic looking. There's a heart. Uh, it's branched like a tree. Um, expected to be flat, not cut in half. Flat, no scales. Cut? Uh, reminds me of a sea creature. It reminds me of a chili pepper. It looks like hair. It reminds me of a pickle. I wonder if an animal did it or if it fell like that from a tree. Reminds me of a bird with feathers extended. I noticed that it looks like a papaya seed inside. Is it hard inside? Very feathery bird. Um, there are fibers alongside the lower scales. It reminds me of roots. I wonder, are they roots? I notice it is clean cut. It looks cut so neatly. I noticed that the thick stem continues all the way through. I, I, see, I totally didn't expect that. That's so weird to me. Uh, the center seems to have light and dark parts. Reminds me of a flagellum. Oh, cool. The center seems to, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Any others? So you see how this works? How did it get severed in half? Was it used in a nature class? How, how are we getting this kind of clean form? Like I've never, in all the pine cones that I've seen nibbled on by squirrels, I've never seen one that was like this. Like David's wondering, like, could this have been a naturalist sort of kind of getting in there in a nature class? I wonder if the feather structures coming off the stem extent, extension feed the scales and the seeds. How are the seeds attached to the core? All right, so you see this reminds me of Einstein's hair, similar to the layers in a tree trunk. Oh, you see, did it get hit by a lawnmower? Does it have heartwood, the light and the dark? Where do the seeds attach? Are there still seeds? Are there places where seeds are obviously missing? It reminds me of the ciliates seen through a microscope, of, of, of ciliates seen through a microscope. I wonder what the center feels like. Oh, this part is smooth, a little bit bumpy. Oh, it is pretty hard. Isn't that cool? You see what this is, all of a sudden, like this, this object becomes really, really interesting because it is interesting, not because it's this, this one object, but because anything in the world around us becomes interesting if we look at it long enough and hard enough to let the mysteries inside it come out and dance with us. But usually we're so satisfied by I have a label for this thing that we never look beneath the surface. We never look long enough to find those observations, to find those questions, to find those connections that reveal the mysteries of the world. So, That's what makes, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of this magic mantra for us as naturalists to get more out of every moment of connection with nature. You can do this with a dandelion. You can do this with the rhododendron. You could do this with, with any species that you see out there. Um, oh, you got a message for me? Absolutely. Go for it. Definitely make those rice noodles. And if you make a little bit, could you make a uh, could you make a little more for me? 
Thank you. I love you. I get rice noodles. Um, so, so what, what you do is, is, is we want to kind of, I have to, my brain is really lazy and I will walk up to a plant and kind of go California poppy. I know what that is. And then I'll like, Oh, I'm on to the next thing. Right. What? What's that over there? Oh, it's a Douglas fir tree. Okay. I'm on to the next thing. So just being able to label things can get my brain into this way of thinking and interacting with the world where I pay attention to what I already know about the thing, but I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of breaks that open and gets me into this zone of geeking out with all the aspects of a phenomenon that I don't understand. And you don't have to have any special prior knowledge to make this really useful and interesting. If you train yourself to observe more carefully, if you train your, this is this new thing that the, the Zoom is doing every time you make a gesture and I don't know how to stop it. Um, the uh, I'll just have to be very careful not to do this. Otherwise Zoom will do that. Um, the, uh, so the, what, what, I, what, I, what I find is, is just magic about this is that with something that I know absolutely nothing about, I can walk up to it and, and use this system, I notice I wonder what it reminds me of, to, to interact with a, a little piece of nature. And invariably, there are secrets and discoveries and things that come out and dance with me. If I can get that information and put it down into a notebook, that notebook can hold so much more information than my electric meat can. And I can get this next thing and this next thing, and this next thing. And then what happens is something that I put in and put down on that paper stimulates another set of neurons to kind of notice something else. And that doesn't really happen if I'm just looking at it with my eyeballs. So I want to invite all of you to consider getting yourself a little notebook, a little notebook to start to record your observations and try this approach. If I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, and you'll find that it changes the way you see and it changes the way you think. And it's really rich and attention, curiosity, and creativity aren't traits that you're born with. They are skills that you can nurture and develop. And you can also do that with your children, with your grandchildren. And you share that with them and the world will open up its secrets to you. I want to thank you for being here tonight. And I want to thank the garden for inviting me out to come play with you. What we're going to do now is we're going to have kind of a question and answer session where um, if there are, you have any questions for, um, for me, there's that question and answer box there. You can drop some questions in there and um, you will put those, those in and, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll try to take a little bit of time here. Oh, um, uh, Mary Ellen is wondering about um, could you please give me your definition for creativity again, All right? Um, so my uh, def definition for creativity is your brain's ability to make useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. Um, so useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. And the more that you practice that, the better and better you'll get at it. Um, am I still on, um, are, are we still, are, do, we, do we have to uh, close up shop? No, you're totally a... fine. I was going to come on and help moderate questions. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, and so, the, the, so why, don't, why don't we both be spotlighted? And I, I believe people can see us both. Um, maybe they can. I just see you. But that's okay. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Ted has got a question, a really interesting one about photography. Um, you know, where does photography fit in um, these methods of observations? Question, it then says not tactile enough, clicking too easily. Um, so photography is a really interesting thing. 
And I want to make a really, really clear distinction between photography and taking snapshots. Um, because if you ever watch a photographer, that camera, you've ever gone on a hike with a photographer, right? That camera slows them down, right? And they find themselves looking for and seeing patterns and seeing, um, uh, seeing aspects of things and compositions and, and values that most of us don't see. So the camera can be a, a, a lens for seeing things differently in the world around you. Um, if, um, but if you're using it to take snapshots or worse, the selfie, where you find something interesting and then you turn your back to it so that you can take the selfie, um, what we find is that that actually impairs our memory and our experience of being there. Um, and there's some data behind this. They gave cameras to people and sent them through an art museum. And they said, we want you to take photographs of the pieces of artwork that really move and inspire you. And people did. And then they came back and they asked those people about those things. And they said, oh, I don't really know. Could I look at my photographs? So the idea sometimes when you take a photograph is that you're going to look at it later. And if you do that, then in the moment, you're not there. So they found that the taking photographs impaired people's ability to pay attention. But then there was an interesting follow-up to that study. So if you're a photographer and going like, wait a minute, this doesn't jive with my personal experience of it, because check this out. Um, what they did is um, they then told people to take the camera and to take a photograph of the parts of the thing that really kind of moved and inspired them and told the story of why that was. And it completely changed the way that people use the camera. And those people had a much better memory of what they were looking at. And, um, and so it's not so much what is the tool, but how you're using the tool. Um, and I'm not anti-photograph. I think that cameras are great, but I want to encourage people to use it as a tool to slow yourself down and pull you into, to let it suck you down the rabbit hole of curiosity, right? Let it help you be something that pulls you into the gravity well of whatever phenomenon is in front of you, right? It's, it, the, the, as, as an object approaches the gravity well of, say, a star, if it's traveling fast enough, it kind of is deflected slightly and then it continues on. But if you're going slowly enough, then you get pulled into the orbit of that flower, that organism. And so if you, you can use, think of curiosity the same way. Bless you. Excuse me. <laughs> um, that the, you can get pulled into the gravity well of a phenomenon if the camera or the tool helps slow you down, and I find the journal really, really helps slow me down to slows me down to the speed of wonders, right? And lets the wonders come out and dance with me. Because normally I'm moving so fast that those wonders just zip past my window. But the journal slows me down to the speed of wonders where I can discover those nuances and those those things that would be just sort of waiting that are just waiting uh waiting for you to come out and play um there's another question um the uh, uh do you find yourself going back to formerly already read and filled journals because something reminds you of another connection Absolutely. Yes. And I do that all the time. I've got to come up with a better way of cross-referencing my journals, but I find myself just, um, I can dive back into them and then find new things and then new questions out of things that um, I've already um, played with. Um, the journals are amazing memory prompts. Um, so the part of your brain that, it, that does memory is the same part of your brain that does attention. So if you um, when you, in the moment you pay deeper attention to something, 
then you um, then your memory is going to be much richer about that thing. So even if your journal disappears and you never look at it again, um, if it slowed you down to the point where you noticed something you otherwise wouldn't have noticed or it's came up with a question you wouldn't have come up with, made a connection that you otherwise might not have, that journal page is successful. Even if it, the journal itself evaporates when you stand up, it's still worthwhile to journal because it's not about the journal page. It's about the experience you have and the connection that you make with nature. Um, David had a thought about the camera and using it together with a journal. It says, I'm thinking maybe the journal should be first and then follow with the camera. That's a really interesting strategy and an idea. Um, sometimes when those cameras make that very satisfying shutter click noise, it sends this signal to your brain saying, you got it, you're done. It's okay to skip ahead and bounce to the next thing. Um, so if you have this feeling of completion, kind of when you take a picture, now I've got it. Like you'll see people walk up to the edge of the Grand Canyon. They'll be like, oh, wow, that's really cool. It's the Grand Canyon. And then they take their picture and then they do this. And they walk away, right? Um, sometimes that, that, that picture that tells us that it's okay to skip ahead to the next thing. But if instead you, um, if in, instead you use it uh, to slow you down, it's, it's a different thing. So that, that strategy that David suggests of, of starting with a journal, that, that what might be a really, really good way to do it. There's an interesting phenomenon called the Zergenic effect. Um, in which when we have a feeling of task completion, our brain then diverts resources that were used to engage with that thing and you uh, allows you to forget all about it. So if you've ever studied for a test and taken that test, you know the power of the Zergenic effect. And we can kind of, if you take a picture and you feel like, okay, now I'm done, then you're zergenic yourself. And, and so um, the, it might be good then to front load with the, the journal, but also being aware of the power of the Zergenic effect where your brain turns off once you think it's got task completion. Um, that's another, that's another uh, useful thing to do. Um, there's a question from um, Andrea that says, when I lead a hike with families in a few weeks, people will not have journals in hand. It's winter. No tools or props except hand lenses. Can I model and practice it with the group orally? Um, so Andrea, first of all, thank you so much for bringing people out into nature. And the nature, the little hand lenses are a great way to focus people's attention. They open up a whole kind of world of wonders when you kind of are able to magnify things like that. And you're absolutely right. You can get the full power of the production effect by doing, I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of just out loud. Um, I wouldn't sort of do it all, uh, all three on the first one, like maybe just start with like, let's say out loud, whatever you see. So if you see something, say something, and then everybody's, you know, looking at the little plant and they're saying what they see, saying what they see, saying what they see, and then may then drop into it. Now, can we come up with any questions and like what questions we can have? And you don't have to answer these questions. Like, wow, that's a really interesting question. Uh, what did you see that, that made you come up with that? Like, oh, that's a really, uh, that's another really rich question. Um, oh, you're thinking about the structure and function. Like what, is, that's a, so you're just sort of noticing the questions that come up. And, um, and then maybe later on, you're turning over the frond of a fern. And then you thought, let's start with that, you know, our observations and questions. And then you drop in the, it reminds me, I was like, what does this remind you of? Have you seen anything that looks like this? Uh, you know, what, uh, you know, in, from, from books, literature, anything that you've seen, anything that you've experienced and let people kind of go out into their own lived experience, find those it reminds me of and bring them back and share them with the group. Um, I do a lot of, um, very often if I lead a bird walk, what I'll do is I'll explain that we're not gonna say the names of any birds, but what we do is I teach them, I notice, I wonder it reminds me of, and then the birds pop up and we do, I notice, I wonder it reminds me of with those. Um, I did a, 
bird walk like that with a group of um, of ranger naturalists from the East Bay Regional Park District. And um, one of them was like the super birder of the group, right? This person knew their birds, like all the little call notes, like, and um, at the end of the, the hike, um, she said, wow, this is the most enjoyable bird walk that I've been on. Well, thank you, honey. Noodles, no fork, but um, this was the most enjoyable bird walk I've been on. And that was, um, that was really, really interesting. So this person really knows their birds. You can do this anywhere, even with birds that you know really well, the birds at your feeder. You do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of with them. Oh, thank you. Got a fork now. Um, and the, and it just gets you looking at those things in a really different way. There was a comment that came into the chat, um, which was a question that I was going to ask you was if you had any um, resource or, or book references. And this person's asking about a, a book. So I thought I'd mention it. It says there's an interesting book, The Rose Method by David, we'll say Pepe. Uh, he talks about qualitative natural history and how to develop felt significance. It's out of print, but available on Amazon. Was that a book that you've heard of? I don't know that book. Okay. Um, that's really fun. Um, I will, I can look into that. Um, that would be qualitative natural history felt significance. That looks like it'd be really fun to, 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 to read. Um, yeah, but my, my, one of my big challenges is that I am dyslexic. And so my ability to read is really, really limited. That might be available for me as a book on tape. Mm. And, um, but that looks good. Yeah. Thinking about some things, you know, sometimes as, you know, scientists will look at things from a very quantitative perspective and you kind of get a different feeling of things as you look at things qualitatively. And I think that as a human being, both of these are really, really valuable to us as naturalists and as human beings to let ourselves feel and let ourselves also analyze. But we just, as, as the scientist, you want to be aware of when you are choosing to kind of explore something with your feelings. And that, that is a different way of kind of knowing and encountering and understanding something than when we are um, are analyzing and kind of looking for kind of evidence and explanations based on things that we can observe. Um, they're both really useful experiences and part of the, uh, for, for us as human beings. So I um, snooped around on your website a little bit, and it's chocked full of such great information. Um, are there any pieces or parts of it that you would suggest um, that kind of goes along with your talk tonight that I can um, provide to our audience as well? Um, let's see. So one really kind of uh, useful thing um, I might direct you to, uh, I, I've got a website, which is johnmuirlaws.com, and I've got hundreds of hours of free nature journaling tutorials mm -hmm. available on that website. Um, we've also started a nonprofit organization called the Wild Wonder Foundation. Um, and the mission of that is to help people connect with the natural world through art, science, nature, and community. And... Um, one of the things which we produced is a little fold out uh, zine, a little um, a little booklet on what is nature journaling that helps you understand. I notice, I wonder, it reminds you of and words, pictures, and numbers, and how to integrate those together, and gives you some starter activities. That little zine is a gorgeous little way to kind of uh, get yourself started in nature journaling. Um, I also have a. Uh, I've got a, a, a book, uh, The Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, that uh, uh, can also help you along that path. And for people who are educators, 
Um, Emily Lagren and I wrote a book um, called um, How to Teach Nature Journaling. It's about how to teach nature journaling. <laughs> and um, that little book is also very useful um, for anyone who's an educator in doing these sorts of things. Um, it's available. You can buy it on my website. You can also there download a free copy of the entire book and all the illustrations in it. Um, uh, for any educator anywhere in the world who would want to use that with their with their students. That's amazing to have those resources. I look forward to digging in personally and um, downloading some of those pieces for some of the programming that we do. Yeah, I, I hope that that will be useful. Yeah. Um, I also see in the note here that a Andrea has uh, put in a, a comment and a question. Yep. Um, uh, it says, as an amateur naturalist documenting seasonal observations, I use a perpetual journal with no days of uh, the week, just January 1st to December 30th. I note observations on the date, uh, making a note of the year. In the end, I can see a decade of observations for uh, any one week. Great for answering the question. Uh, isn't this too soon for blackbirds? Um, Andrea, that's a great um, idea and a really terrific activity. Um, a really good way to do things. This idea of the, the perpetual journal again. You're, it, so most of my journals I'm going chronologically and, and I am always putting in, you know, what is the date of this observation and uh, where am I? So that kind of metadata gives you kind of a reference of where it is. But then to be able to look across January's I have to go through all my journals in my closet and pull out this one and pull out this one and pull out this one. Um, what Andrea is able to do is she opens it to that one week in January and anything she notices on that week, right? It's there on that page. That's a that's a really cool way of um, kind of a um, an analog version of a kind of cross reference database. That's very very cool. Um, um, uh, Andrea continues with another note, says not nearly um, of the, uh, the the detail of the Folsom Nature Journal, but a great record. Uh, will you let us know um, those resources you just described while I was uh, writing? So um, the uh, the so uh, j just uh, so so and Andrea is, is uh, and Ted is saying like so what's the perpetual journal? Um, the so there's there's two ways of you can think about the journal. One is are you going to do it chronologically? You know, here's this day, then here's the next day, then here's the next day, then here's the next day. So um, let me uh, kind of open this up and give you an example of that. It's now getting dark where we are, so I'm turning on my light. I'm going to turn on my document camera again, and we'll take a kind of look down to, there we go. Um, so, uh, you know, here, um, you know, here's, 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 here's one day. Um, hey, it's the start of uh, 2024. Um, and then you kind of hop into the next day. Um, and so as you're kind of going along, you're going in that same year kind of chronologically with the things that you are observing. Um, so for the perpetual journal, um, what you would do is you would have a different structure to it where an individual page would be the, um, it would be, like the first month of January. And then in 2022, I would put something here. And 2023, I would put something here. 2024, I would put something here. And then this next page would be the second month of January, right? So that um, I can kind of see what's generally happening in that time of the year across a bunch of years all in one place. And there's no reason that you can't use both of those together, right? So you can have have one um, one journal 
where you're kind of doing things sequentially, maybe going into a little bit more detail. Um, or um, you can um, have a, uh, uh, a, a and a, a sort of perpetual journal. I sometimes use this for 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 both a little bit. Um, so, for instance, here I've got some notes on this weird tomato that was sprouting in my kitchen, and then over um, the next several days, um, I you know here's that same here's here's another tomato that is sprouting out of its skin on September fifteenth, and then here it is on the seventeenth. Here it is September twenty second. Um, here it is October second, and then it's all rotten by October 11th. I mean, that was a big change right there. Um, so this is a little bit, uh, you're sort of, you know, time traveling in this, but in a perpetual journal, you'd have the same month or the same week of the year um, for each, each page, or some people have it for the same day. Um, um, uh, and uh, Andrea, the, the book that I was recommending uh, that I mentioned is this one. Um, this is, uh, it's also available on johnmuirlaws.com. Um, encourage people to buy it either from my bookstore or to go to your local independent bookstore. Um, uh, if we order everything from Amazon, we're really hurting those, those, those local booksellers. And it turns out Jeff Bezos is already doing pretty well. So um, you can support your own local booksellers um, or the original artist. So this is a book that I wrote about how to do nature journaling. Some strategies with inquiry, like I'll bet in there that where I sort of describe uh, the I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of process. Um, but then I get into this section in the back, like there's a whole section on drawing birds. There's a whole section on on uh, drawing insects. There's a whole section on birds, mammals, flowers, plants, mushrooms, trees, landscapes, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, the purpose of, of keeping a nature journal, it's not that you have to make a perfect scientific illustration of something, but um, very often, having some tools up your sleeve and kind of knowing like, oh, that's how you get this sense of an iridescent insect. I see what you're doing now. Um, those are those are useful, useful strategies. So I try to give people a lot of techniques to help them be able to render what they see as well as um, some strategies for how you keep uh, can can keep your own nature journal. Wow, that's an amazing book. <laughs> and to go back to Andrew's question about how to um, kind of find out about these different pieces that you've said tonight, um, what I will do on our third Thursday lecture page is put the recording when it's ready. And I will also do hyperlinks to a bunch of the resources that uh, we discussed tonight, including um, John's website and the Wild Wonder Foundation website and links to some of the other uh, books and resources. I'll do a little bit of research and, and share that with you all. So it'll all be in one spot um, when I share that next week. Okay. Thank wow. you for doing that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for sharing all your, your knowledge with us and allowing um, all those free nature journaling classes and downloads and all of um sharing yeah. your time and talent for sure. Yeah, there's there's no paywall paywall on my website. Um, so you can see hundreds of hours of nature drilling tutorials for free um, there. And if you're able to make a donation to support me and my family, I greatly appreciate that. That's a big part of how I survive. Um, and uh, um, But if people are not able to do that, then it is all accessible to everybody at no cost. Um, Stacy's got a question about uh, tools and equipment. Um, I have... Uh, a sort of tools and materials section on my website for free. There's also a section in the nature drawing and journaling. But in answer to your question about colored pencils, I think they are a great way to um, start to add color into your nature journaling notes. Um, I usually bring um, 
a small set of colored pencils and um, a portable watercolor kit with me. But there's a kind of more of a learning curve with watercolor. So just starting yourself with a, um, a set of uh, watercolors is, I mean, a set of colored pencils is a terrific way to go. That's wonderful. Yeah, adding adding those color pops, um, I'm sure help to differentiate different things that you're doing as well. So, well, we are over time by a little bit, but this was an awesome discussion. So I didn't want to break it up too soon. I, um, I told you you'd need the hook uh, <laughs> for me. Yeah, the rice noodles I, came in. That'll that yeah, the rice noodles too. came in to, yeah. to to help me cut. Yeah, I've now got my rice noodles in front of me, so I could kind of keep going forever. Um, <laughs> but I really want to thank everybody for coming up and uh, joining us uh, this 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 evening. Um, you can find more stuff about me and the work that I do at johnmirlaws.com. I also recommend that you check out the Wild Wonder website. That's the nonprofit organization that we've we've started. Um, and um, I'm really delighted to have been invited to come and talk with all of you. And um, and thank you so much. Yeah, right back at you. Thanks for being with us. And um, like I said, I'll share all those resources and the recording when we're ready to go next week. Um, thanks to those of you who are still out there asking questions and chatting. Um, I'm so glad that we sparked a, a wonderful conversation tonight. So. Um, hopefully we will see you again on a uh, another virtual lecture our next third Thursday since this one kind of went in between the um, January and February um, our topic on Thursday February 15th is about solitary B hotels so come come join us and see what the buzz is all about Ooh, I see what you did there yeah mm. yeah yeah I'm gonna leave us on that note <laughs> ah very very good awesome thanks again and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Bye.